Um, I, uh, first off, my name is Fred Campbell. For those who don't know me, um, I am the new executive director of the Howard County Historical Society. Um, so first, I want to uh, in, uh, just welcome everybody to this meeting. But uh, all of you were emailed uh, the agenda. And um, hopefully you're able to see that. If you're not, uh, we'll certainly just kind of go through it step by step as we're moving through the agenda. And what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna take a quick step back. I'm going to hand over um, uh, the meeting to um, Ellen for a minute or two, Ellen Flynn Giles, who's the, uh, the president of the board and to let her talk for just a second or two, okay? Thank you, Fred. Um, as Fred said, I'm Ellen Flynn Giles. Um, I wanna take this opportunity to welcome all our members to the Howard County Historical Society's 2022 annual meeting and thank you all for your loyal and generous support as we grappled with the continuing uncertainties and challenges of this pandemic. And while we are saddened to bid farewell to our talented former executive director, Sean Gladden and deputy director and volunteer extraordinaire, Paulette Lutz, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Fred Campbell, former HCC history professor and society collections manager and our most recent deputy director who has stepped forward valiantly to take on the challenges of executive director. So I'm gonna turn it back to you now, Fred, to do the introductions and recognition among staff and volunteers. Okay, awesome, thank you very much. Um, first off, I uh, wanna thank you all for uh, this privilege to step into um, this particular position. I uh, started on January 1st, but for those who know me, I was here a number of months beforehand uh, working on the archives as a collections manager and helping out with a number of the events that occurred uh, in 2021. Um, I look at this as a fantastic opportunity uh, to be able to sort of preserve and present Howard County history, uh, not only to the members, but also to the broader public um, over the course of uh, 2022. So I'm very honored to, to uh, take on that role and I uh, look forward to all of the many rewards and even looking forward to some of the challenges that will occur. Um, because of that, some other things have changed and I just wanna take a minute to introduce um, a few of some new faces that you might see if you come into the museum or you come into the archives, you'll see that there's a few new faces here and just really quickly gonna just um, share my screen Got a nice little slide here. Uh, we have um, three new um, uh, paid positions that are working here at the Historical Society. We have um, Ellen Lewis, who is on the call right now um, and is now our new office manager. She's an individual that is going to be uh, stepping into the role of sort of organizing and running the office that is located at our archives at the uh, Miller Branch uh, Library on the second floor. If you've never ever been there, please come on by and say hello. We also have brought on Aiden Connor in a part-time role as the lead uh, museum docent down at the Museum of Howard County History. Um, he will definitely be there on the weekends when the museum is open, but he's there other times working on the collection, um, accessioning, helping set up exhibits. And he actually did his first sort of mini exhibit uh, which is hanging in the museum at this moment, um, which uh, sort of showcases the EC200 items that we had in our collection. You got this wonderful shadow box. You can kind of see the things that were uh, sort of talked about, the events that occurred and some of the accoutrement that went along with that particular event uh, 50 years ago. I will be talking about EC250 a little bit later in my presentation today. And then we've also brought along uh, Gita Shangbag, who was, uh, is, our uh, lead researcher. And she's helping the volunteer researchers and re doing research herself uh, for any member requests that come in. When the public comes in looking for anything from marriage certificates, doing research on a paper, writing a book, researching a property, Gita is gonna be our lead researcher in helping organize and processing those requests as quickly as possible. Um, also, we'll be having later on in 2022, two new positions. When we have our new Children's Museum open, which we'll be talking about a little later on today, we're gonna to be bringing in a museum docent, and we're also gonna be bringing on a collections manager. Uh, we've done some fantastic things, which I'll talk about a little bit later concerning our archives and our collection. 
uh, but it's there's more to do. It's uh, if anybody's ever worked in an archive or in a museum before, it's endless. The the challenges of organizing and processing uh, never ends. I do want to point out that all three of these new hires started as volunteers here at the Howard County Historical Society. I'm a major believer of promoting from within when people show that they have a passion and that they have an interest in what we're trying to do as an organization. I wanna bring them in as employees when possible because that dedication will carry into that new role. So these three individuals are absolutely fantastic. I would recommend wandering by the archive of the museum and saying hello whenever you get uh, the opportunity. Um, speaking of volunteers, and I will talk about um, one volunteer in particular right now, but I also, when I do my presentation later, I'm gonna talk about some broader aspects of volunteers. We have a number of wonderful volunteers that have done a tremendous, tremendous amount of work um, here at the um, Howard County Historical Society. And one of the things that we wanna make sure that we do is that we recognize their efforts. Now, some of that recognition just comes on a daily basis when we thank them for the work that they do. Um, Ellen uh, is fantastic at bringing in treats and candy, cookie and muffins, which always get smiles from uh, the, uh, the volunteers. So we wanna make sure we appreciate them. We have a volunteer appreciation night once a year where we take uh, the volunteers out, treat them uh, to some, some nice drinks and some food. Uh, but we also wanna make sure that we recognize those volunteers that really go above and beyond. And I wanna take a second and mention Laura Fletcher, who is on the Zoom meeting right now. Hi, Laura, glad you could join us today. Um, Laura has been a volunteer for our organization for a while now. And after we reopened um, uh, early, sort of mid, uh, 2021, Laura was right back here at the archives helping out. Uh, she has done a number of different projects over the course of time that she's been here, sometimes smaller projects that might just require a couple of minutes, like if you're processing a, a marriage certificate, she helps out with research, but she was the key researcher in one of the biggest research projects of the entire year. The Howard County uh, government asked us to compile information and data for their naming commission. Uh, we have a number of locations throughout the county that the county names, and they wanted research done on all of those places. And it was hundreds of locations, and they wanted to know, you know, who is this named after, a history of that individual, the history of that group, or the history of that location, so that they could have a sort of a, a more informed idea of what we're what we do here in Howard County in terms of naming buildings roads, schools, and things of that nature. Um, it turned out to be a massive project. And Lauren was here um, multiple times a week, delving into that research. And without her help, we could not have accomplished this mission. So because of that, I'm gonna try a little bit of Zoom magic here and see if I can pull this off. I have a little package for Lauren. I'm gonna pass this to you via the internet. Is it coming to you, Lauren? Oh, look at that. Look at the magic that we've pulled. And in that package, really? we have a little bit of a, a, an award for you. So go ahead and take that out, Lauren. Uh-oh, you froze. Are you a wizard? <laughs> the magic went away. <laughs> there you are. Now you're not frozen anymore. Oh, wow. So, um, Lauren, you, we've awarded you the Volunteer of the Year Award and just want to say thank you so much for the efforts that you put in. And we're looking forward to all of the other things that you'll be doing for us in the future. You are a fantastic example of what volunteering is about, not just at our organization, but organizations everywhere that rely on volunteers. So thank you very much. And I'm sure I'll see you next week when you come back in. Uh, but um, uh, enjoy that. And again, thank you again. And, and also just a side note for those people who wondered how we did the package thing, that's a Zoom plus feature. You'll have to subscribe <laughs> to that. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that too much. But Lauren, did you want to say anything real quick or did you have anything? Um... Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, it's been a rewarding experience working on, not, work, not just working on a naming commission, but also working at the Historical Society and finding out that I do have a passion for history and finding out new things about different places and people and events. And it's been and it also been an amazing experience working with an incredible co-volunteers and working under 
Paulette and Sean Gladden, who unfortunately couldn't be here. And it's also great working with Fred. And I'm sure he's going to be an incredible new director of the Historical Society. And believe it or not, I did have him as a professor when I was attending Howard Community College, which was decades ago. And he was an incredible <laughs> history teacher. So it was great working with him again. And it was great, great doing this project with everyone. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. Again, a round of applause to you. Thank you very much for all of the efforts that you've put into the Historical Society. All right. Um, now, what I want to do is, if I'm looking at the agenda correctly, um, I'm going to hand it over uh, the, the meeting over to Ellen, who's going to have um, some recognition, um, um, do some special recognition, and also talk about the new class that's coming along uh, in the, on the board. So I will mute myself, and I will hand it over to Ellen. Thank you, Fred. And, and also, thank you, Lauren, for the hard work you did. And we truly are a, an organization that runs on volunteers. So thank you very much for proving the proof in the pudding. Um, so I just want to review a little bit about what this year has been like and then move forward with the recognize some, some people and then move forward with the business part of the meeting. Um, and just remind everybody that Against all odds, we've actually emerged stronger than ever with a, a this year with a record increase in membership, successful deployment of new online programs and community engagement opportunities, and some really exciting updates to our facilities. Uh, the spectacular restoration and protection of the Museum of Howard County History's late 19th century stained glass windows are in full bloom and you should stop by and enjoy those. And we've made steady progress on the four year process to rehabilitate the Ellicott Second Quaker School warehouse into a home for the new Ellicott Mills Children's Museum. And we can all hardly wait until that April opening because it's going to be really exciting. Um, through it all, we've continued to make progress in expanding the resources available through our website, introducing access to our research data and collections online, improving our archives and collections management, delivering interesting lunch dates with history to an even wider audience by using um, online options and mounting exciting new um, exhibits for EC250. And we wanna thank you all because it's the time, talent and treasure of our members and volunteers that make this possible and that encourage us as we head into an exciting new year of celebrating Ellicott City's 250th birthday. So first I wanna give some special recognition from the board to Sean Gladden, who served as our executive director for the last nine years. And as our executive director, Sean led us through a period of tremendous growth as a society with talent, energy, and enormous enthusiasm. We truly would not be where we are today without his leadership, his focus on community outreach and partnership and commitment to telling all of Howard County stories. And we wish him well in his new adventure in Pennsylvania. And we look forward to sharing with Sean a thank you gift from the board in recognition of his long and productive service. We also want to look forward rec to recognizing Paulette Lutz, who has served as a volunteer, society board member, society board president, and the deputy director for too many years to count accurately. There is virtually no aspect of the society's work over the last quarter century in which she has not played an important role. And as she looks forward to New Horizons, we wanna honor her service and assure her continued society connection with the award of a lifetime membership. So congratulations, Paulette. We welcome you forever to be a member of the society. And we also look forward to sharing with her a thank you gift in recognition of her service. And we give our thanks to uh, both Sean and Paulette for their dedication to the society. And now back to the business of the membership. Uh, the board is delighted to recommend the following board members to the membership for confirmation as the board class of 2022-25. Um, these names are all on your agenda, but Bob Cecil, Tom Goss, and Amy Noggle are being welcomed as new members, while May Beal, Martha Clark, Ann Schoenhut, and George Tolan have volunteered to continue their service on the board. We'd like to ask you to indicate your approval with raised hands, either by using one of the more functions, um, by entering some yes in the chat, 
or by just raising your hand physically so that we can confirm that this is approved. And so I'll ask everybody to do that. Love raised hands. <laughs> And we are looking good. So thank you all. And let's give a warm welcome to the new board class of 2022-2025. And now at this time, I ask the membership to indicate their approval of the board's recommended slate of officers for 2022. And we're gonna do the same thing, but I will just go through and name them so that um, everybody is familiar with um, who's gonna be on the leadership team going forward. Um, I've been recommended to continue as president. Tom Goss has stepped forward as second vice president, George Tolan as treasurer. Uh, Patricia Greenwald has volunteered to come forward as corresponding secretary. Rita Hamlet will continue as recording secretary and Steve Castro will serve as past president. I wanna thank everyone who stepped forward who is new, those who have moved to slightly different positions and, and those who are continuing in their original roles from last year. Um, it's a really going to be a wonderful team. So I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing. Raise hands. You guys are really proficient at this. This is wonderful. So thank you and welcome to the 2022 leadership uh, team. And I know we're gonna have a good year together. So now I'm gonna move forward to the finance and collections committee summaries. Um, and so I'm moving forward. Okay, so for 2021, as of December 31st, the society recorded a negative of $13,042 in net income. However, there are still outstanding grant and reimbursement awards that are expected to be resolved by the end of February and, and will be reflected in those revised figures. In the meantime, we have a retained surface of $101,967 to move us forward into the new year. As, as some may be aware or, or not, we're on a calendar year, fiscal year, while the county is on um, a county government fiscal year from July to June. And so the receipt of awards from county and state governments is sometimes off that budget. So we always try to retain an adequate surplus in order to keep us moving until the next year's grants are awarded. Uh, for the 2022 budget, um, this budget reflects um, adjustments to address a phased return to in-person events and celebrations such as EC250, which we couldn't be more excited about. Um, these include an expanded walking tour schedule, new historical bus tours, the grand opening of the Children's Museum, uh, exciting new exhibits at, at both museums, and a long awaited return to our in-person annual holiday house tour which this year will be focused on Old Ellicott City and a journey from Milltown to, um, to City. So things are looking exciting as we move forward. Um, and again, we're, we're excited. Um, on collections, while our pandemic, pandemic focus has been primarily on improving management of our archives research center resources, while also just keeping things running in general and reaching out to meet our mission. Other ongoing projects include accessioning and digitizing slides of Ellicott City and other locations in Howard County, continuing the organization and verification of artifact locations in the basement of the Museum of Howard County, County History and also on exhibit in the museum and undertaking the clearing out of accessioned items that have been in temporary storage in the former circuit courthouse as we looked at the renovations in our facilities. So everything is looking up. Um, I know that we can look forward to your support and joining us as we, as we move forward. 
So I will now turn it over for the membership committee update from Rita Hamlet. Hi, everybody. Good to see you all. Good afternoon. Um, we had a great year. So the membership revenue was a record of $32,430, exceeding the goal by 35%. So that's pretty amazing. And again, considering that uh, still in a pandemic and those kinds of things, that's just such strong support. So thank you very much. I also want to um, mention that the Historical Society added a educator student membership level this year, and it's rewarding volunteers who contribute 20 or more hours in a year with um, a 50% off individual or family level membership. So please keep that in mind, anyone that is looking forward to or continuing as um, volunteers. So the total count for membership right now, current members are 447 as of December 31st. This is 66 corporate bronze, 12 corporate gold, 11 corporate silver, 143 family, 211 single, and four student. All in all, a very fabulous year. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rita. Finding that mute button is sometimes very, very um, challenging. Um, we managed to get done with the business pretty fast, so we're really ready to move on to the keynote and presentations. We're a little bit ahead of time, but I think we're okay because we've gotten up to 38 participants and that looks like a pretty healthy um, attendance. So I'm gonna move this back to Fred Campbell and ask him to take it away. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Yeah, uh, we are definitely ahead of schedule. And if uh, anybody is upset that we uh, end before three o'clock, you know, um, we can get you some counseling, uh, free hugs, things of that nature. But it's rare that people are upset that a Zoom meeting ends early, I, I think. But um, nonetheless, um, we uh, did have a, a different keynote speaker arranged, but unfortunately uh, that has changed. And because of that, I've stepped into the void uh, to kind of focus on uh, sort of a two-part idea here, this idea of um, sort of where we've come in 2021 and talk about where we're going and hopefully give you some great visuals. Also maybe spur you to think about maybe doing some things uh, with the uh, Historical Society this coming year and maybe tell others about it. So um, I'm gonna switch over to my PowerPoint a little bit. Um, I will um, pause my personal part of the presentation twice uh, to hand it over to other individuals who will uh, give you a little bit of an update on some, some key aspects of what's gonna be happening, what has happened in 2021 and what will be happening um, in 2022. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Again, I want to welcome everybody here to the uh, annual meeting. And I just want to, again, focus on where we've been and where we're headed, focusing on the last year and the year that's coming up. Um, you know, this is, I, although I had volunteered for the organization um, a number of times over the course of the last few years, uh, and been a speaker at a couple of events and things of that nature, I really became involved with this uh, organization in 2021. And I've really seen a lot of aspects of this organization grow and really want to share with you what has been happening here in case you, you haven't been in the loop. Now, um, the first thing and probably the most important thing is that we reopened. Uh, COVID forced us to shut down uh, not only the archives, but the museum. And if you didn't know, we're open. The doors are open. You can physically come in again. Um, we are here at the archives Monday through Friday, 10 to 5. Um, and the Museum of Howard County History is open Friday through Sunday, 1 through 5. And a whole bunch of things, which I'm going to talk about uh, over the next couple of minutes, have been happening in both of those locations. And I would be more than happy to uh, show you around, give you uh, some, some insider information as to the, some of the changes that have taken place and showcase some of the things that have occurred over the last uh, year or so. So just make sure that if people don't know, we are open for business and we're back, all right? Um, 
uh, traffic in the archives has gone uh, has increased from month to month. We've gone from strength to strength. And at the museum, we're seeing our numbers steadily increase. As always, you know, the colder months, it goes down a little bit. You know, if you have a, a Saturday with the wind blowing the way it did two, two or three weeks ago, not going to get as many visitors as during a nice uh, spring day. Uh, but we are absolutely open. Now, a couple of things that have happened in 2021. Again, focusing back on where we've been. A major project, capital project that we undertook in the Museum of Howard County History was the removing cleaning and reinstallation of our stained glass windows. And I just wanna show you a couple of pictures that I took a few days ago of these windows. They are magnificent. Uh, if you come in at certain times of the day, they look different from other times of the day. If you look at the slide that I'm showing you, the one window on the left was taken on one side of the museum and the other one on the right was taken on the other side of the museum. So depending on the placement of the sun, these windows change, but they are gorgeous fantastic major renovations took place. Um, and for those individuals that had been in the museum before and saw those windows and have gone in afterwards, there is a major change. So, and there's more than just these four that I showed uh, are showing you here. There are numerous windows throughout the museum uh, that in and of themselves are, are worth coming in and taking a look at. So that window installation is 99% complete. We have one or two protective um, panels that we're putting uh, on the outside of these windows that need to be finished. But aside from that, uh, we can pretty much say it is done. We had a wonderful um, uh, uh, event, sort of rededicating the windows. A number of speakers came, explained the process. Um, and it is a really intricate, detailed process. It isn't that you just take them out, get a little Windex and throw them back in. This was this was a major, major renovation. So we should be really proud as an organization that we are preserving these important, important uh, windows here. Um, another thing that happened was we had the installation of a road marker dedicated to a local suffragette uh, by the name of Laura Byrne, who uh, led uh, the campaign for women to get the right to vote um, and was influential in, in pushing through the amendment to the constitution that allowed that. It was the 100th anniversary in 2020 uh, for that uh, event. And there is a uh, national road marker trail which exists where a number of local and state and nationally known individuals received markers dedicated to their work and effort at the beginning of the 20th century. And Howard County is no exception. So we had a physical marker put right outside the museum. You're more than welcome to drive by and read the marker at any time. Um, inside the museum, we've also added an information panel about Laura Burns, so we can sort of connect those two spaces. And we had a number of delegates come down to the museum uh, for that dedication ceremony. It was a wonderfully attended ceremony, and there was a lot of great buzz and enthusiasm. And more than, uh, more than a couple of people have come into the museum and asked about that road marker. So it's important. It's another way that we can get individuals to look at the spaces that we're in charge of as the historical society and uh, draw them in uh, to what we're doing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a wonderful addition, and I look forward to uh, more things along those lines happening, which I'll talk about a few of them uh, later on in my lecture. One of the other things that also returned to the Historical Society was our bus tours. Uh, 2020 and uh, part of most of 2021, it was impossible to uh, sort of get members and the public out to these locations uh, across Maryland that focus on uh, history. And uh, we decided that we were going to restart this. So over the summer, we had the National Road Bus Tour, which took uh, uh, participants down Main Street in Ellicott City and all the way out to Frederick, Maryland um, for lunch, where we dined at a place called Brewer's Alley, had a fantastic lunch. And then we continued on uh, all the way until we got to Boonesboro, Maryland stopping along the way probably about a dozen times talking about important historical events that occurred on our national road also known as the frederick turnpike uh, we then went to the national road museum that is uh, going to be opening this year we got a sneak peek behind the scenes and met um, some volunteers that work there that showed us the wonderful museum in boonesboro that will be opening up soon 
Um, so this was a, a benefit to members and to the public uh, that we weren't able to offer for about a year and a half because of uh, COVID. Now, I will talk a little bit later about some things that are happening in 2022, where we will be continuing these bus tours, getting people out to get hands-on tactile experience uh, uh, in terms of history, local history that uh, is all around us. Um, one of the other things we talked about our um, volunteer of the year, Laura Fletcher, I want to share um, uh, a couple of statistics with you, something that we can take a bit of pride in. Um, over the course of 2021, 37 volunteers logged in 2,496 hours in our archive and museum. Now that is the bare minimum amount of hours because we do have volunteers that have come in and forgot to put their hours in. And we do have a number of sort of one-off events where we will see um, volunteer uh, numbers increase, not only in the number of volunteers we have, but also in those hours. Things such as the Howard County Fair, Maryland's Farm holiday event that we held, but we've had a huge turnout in terms of volunteers. And one of the things we need to remember is that we weren't open uh, the first couple of months of the year. Nobody could come in to the archive and work uh, in January, February, and March. Um, so the fact that we have this many volunteers and a number of them coming in regularly, there's, there's a good, I'd say 15 volunteers that we see on a, more than a weekly basis, some coming in every single day uh, that come in and do a couple of hours. And for those individuals that um, are interested in volunteering or at least want to spread the word, we have dozens of volunteer opportunities here at the Howard County Historical Society, whether it's coming in and helping us, us with accessioning collections, uh, accessioning items into our collection, whether it's writing for the legacy newsletter, whether it's helping uh, individuals with research requests that they have, uh, whether it's coming down to be a docent uh, in our museum. There's a whole bunch of opportunities there, and we are more than eager to welcome individuals into our organization and give you some training to help you help us bring history alive for individuals, whether it's in educational opportunities for students, whether it's sort of more professional um, uh, level writing that you want to do some real scholarly work. We have tons of opportunities. So what I would love to see in 2022 when I do the uh, uh, presentation uh, next year is I'd love to see those numbers increase. And we're already seeing signs uh, the first couple of months of this year that those numbers will go up. So that's a point of pride that we should take as an organization, our volunteers and the hours that they have put in. One of the other things that we did in 2021 was we really started to focus heavily on reorganizing our collections. Now, for those of you who don't know, our collection is really broken into two major parts. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of paper, uh, what we would call ephemera, here at the archive, uh, which is located on the second floor of the Miller Branch Library. But then down at the museum in the basement, we have objects that are, that are there. And one of the things that we sort of had recognized over the summer, me working with uh, the former executive, uh, Sean Glad and others, is that we really needed to come up with some uh, means of, of really tightening up uh, our collection so that the, the collection itself could be more accessible and more useful for researchers and for the general public that's just interested in finding out what we have. So what we did was this. We started aggressively accessioning items. And I'm going to give you a couple of numbers here. We had 95 collections come into the archives in the course of uh, 2021. Now, again, I want you to make sure that you understand that about a quarter of the year, we couldn't do anything because we weren't even able to get to those collections because the museum uh, or the museum was closed at times and the library was closed for a long period of time. But 95 accessions collections came into our, to our, uh, our, our 95 collections came into our organization. 1,727 individual objects and items were accessioned, meaning that we have now moved from them sitting on the shelf, waiting for us to process them, to being processed to the point where somebody wants to do research, they can utilize those archival uh, sources. Uh, we've also undertaken something called the Blue Dot Project. If you come into our archives, I'd be welcome. I would welcome that uh, and 
would be more than happy to give you a tour of what we have here. And if you come, you'll notice that these boxes all throughout our collection all have these blue dots. What we've done is, as volunteers as, is, is take down these boxes, make sure that in our um, computer program, which is known as Pass Perfect, it's a, a very well-known and well-used archival program, uh, we made sure that those items were logged in properly and had location markers so that we can find them. Uh, my, my basic sort of requirement for an archive of, of, our, of our status is that I want to make sure that we know what we have and where it's located. So we have processed and made sure that we took down, physically looked at, confirmed on the computer, well over 5,000 items over the course of the year. It's an amazing undertaking, and I can't praise the volunteers who've helped out with that enough. Uh, one of the other things we've done is we sort of did a reorganization of the museum basement. Uh, we have made sure that, that along with like the blue dot project, we've made sure that everything's placed properly. We sort of ungunged some of the things that were down there that needed to be moved around and organized better. And hopefully now that that space is organized, we'll be able to move into the basement of the Weir building, which needs some work. And there's some things over at the courthouse that we're storing that are gonna come back into the museum. And now we're able to bring those items back in. So our archival reorganization has been fantastic. Now, one of the things if you've, if over the course of 2021, if you have driven past the Museum of Howard County History, you've been up there by the courthouse and you've driven by, you would have seen a tremendous amount of activity going on on that little building right next door to the museum, known as the Second Quaker School, known as the Weir Building, and eventually we're going to be calling it the Children's, the Ellicott Mills Children's Museum. So you might have seen some, some windows coming down, some windows going up, some paint being put on, some things moved around, some landscaping happening. Almost every single day of 2021, if you had driven by, there would have been activity going on there. A tremendous undertaking has been done to re um, renovate that space so that we can have this wonderful um, uh, new museum added to our uh, historical society. Now that renovation has been overseen by a number of individuals, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take a back seat and I am going to uh, bring in George Tolan, who has been uh, central to this renovation over the course of 2021. And I wanted to talk about a little bit the, um, the, the different things that have happened in that space. So here's where my technical nuance is going to slip a little bit. I'm gonna have to say to George, I'm about to make you the co-host so he's able to share his PowerPoint with you. I've just made you a co-host. And George, if you wanna take over, I'm gonna mute myself and I'll let you take it away for a couple of minutes sharing that wonderful space. Okay. All yours, George. Yeah, let's see if we can get this thing sorted out. Uh, back up to the, to the beginning. Yeah, I'm just gonna go with there. Uh, I'm not sure that that uh, what's happened here. I'm not sure that most of the people on the on the in the, the society know what's going on with the school. Uh, it was originally built. This building was originally built in 1790. Uh, it was originally built as as a Quaker school. It uh, was bought. It went over to private residency sometime in the early 1800s, uh, and it went through a variety of, of uh, <clears throat> expansions. I think uh, what Ellen called uh, architectural evolution and adaptive use. Uh, it was used as a, a hospital in World in uh, World War Eight, War of eighteen twelve. Uh, it passed on to private residency after that, and major alterations were done. Uh, you can see from the screen you have now uh, there are two front doors to this building. Okay, originally built uh, as a stone structure facing south with a porch all the way across the width. Uh, it was built by the Quakers as a school. Uh, when it passed into private use, it was expanded to the north. And you can see from the screen uh, here that uh, it has two completely different personalities. The, the, the stone structure facing south is the original structure. Uh, the, the photograph on the left uh, is the opposite side, which faces Park Street. Uh, this was the addition that was put on sometime, I guess, in the middle 1800s. Uh, to do that, they excavated back into a hill because this building was built into a, into a steep slope. 
uh, added 16 feet to the rear and they actually added a new roof line. The original structure was, had a gable roof. Uh, they added the stone on each side uh, and put a salt box roof on it. Uh, and and the, the, the construction of this thing has really been a headache because when it was built, uh, they added a gable roof in 1910, which I can show you in just a second. Uh, and they built that right on top of the existing salt box roof. So the, the, the uh, 18, called 1850s, salt box roof, even with its metal membrane on top of it, still exists and it's sandwiched between the ceiling of the second floor and the, the floor of the attic. So we could walk down and take a look, say this is what we've done. Uh, this is the, what we would call second floor of the building. This is the, the floor that will open up to Park Avenue facing the courthouse. Uh, it, is, it, it, it has an at grade entrance. Uh, you'll see that in the photograph as we go along. Uh, and what we've done, uh, and, and Pat uh, Greenwald and Ann Schoenhardt have been, this has been their dream for many, many years, and have been instrumental, and I think Pat will be on here next to share uh, the programs that we we'll want. But there are four display areas that we have here, starting with a mills room, uh, which will be about the, the uh, flour mills and, and other mills that existed in early Ellicott City. Uh, the school room, which will represent school, it will have the, the school desk as they would have been in the early 1800s, general stores the same way, and the great room, which, are, which again, Pat can explain to you, will be basically the, the where people would live or what we would call today a living room or a family room, okay? This are, these are photographs of those rooms as they are today, renovated, okay? Uh, on the upper left is, is a mill room. Because the construction of this building was so unusual, we decided to make a window into the wall. What you see here, is basically a bit of the framing of the original structure that was done in, in the late 1800s. Uh, so we wanted to leave that out. It, it's kind of give us an industrial look uh, and it will be in the, in the mills room, which will be about basically the mill industry that existed in Elkin City at the time. Uh, the other three rooms below, these are as they are today, uh, not quite done. Uh, we, because of the age of the building and, and basically the neglect of the building over probably the previous century, uh, the floors up here were in pretty rough shape. Uh, we overlaid them with yellow pine at random width and refinished them. All the old uh, plaster walls were pulled out and redone uh, to mimic the look of plaster. Uh, the, the center photograph, which is the school room, has got some of the color put into it. Uh, the next week uh, the, or a week from today, uh, the painters will come back to re will return and put the finished work and each room will have a different color. Uh, and, and, and truthfully, it is going to be spectacular, I think, when it is done. Uh, we'll move on. Each one of these rooms has been sponsored. And this, I think, is very important in the long run. Each one of these rooms has been sponsored. Each sponsor has donated a substantial sum of money and, and to have their name put on it and to continue to help with this museum. Uh, the school room is sponsored by Tom and Ann Clark Schoenhut uh, and Ray and Patricia Greenwald. The great room is, is sponsored by the Honus family. The garden is by the John Slack family and the Slack funeral home. And the general store is Tom and Sally Goss. And the mills room is Ron and Ellen Flynn Giles. Each one of those has put up $5,000, which the board has selected to put into a maintenance and operation, not, not even a maintenance fund, an upkeep fund for the building. So when we finally get done and turn this thing over, uh, hopefully that the continued exterior maintenance uh, and perhaps upgrades uh, will not be a burden uh, on the operational finances of the society. Uh, there, we've done some work to the outside. We still have, there's a, an addition that was put on the east wall that belonged to the county. It, when the county bought it in 1951, uh, they, they used it as a planning and zoning office and then the state's attorney's office. And they put a brick addition on the east wall, which is now currently called the vault, which it was a vault for state's attorney's trial evidence. Uh, that has been converted and we can see that in, as we go a little further along. Uh, this project was started, uh, management was started by Tom Bauer, who was the president at the time when I joined. And unfortunately he passed away very suddenly, uh, which left me in charge of the project as it turns out. But we've decided, that we got far enough along when Tom was still alive. And this is the part of our, our first phase of construction. This is the Southern elevation facing over a steep hill down and overlooking basically Main Street in Ellicott City. The stonework here in the porch that you see, 
is part of the original construction of the building. Uh, the fancy, uh, as Alan calls the lace work, it's actually cast iron, not wrought iron, was added sometime in the late 1800s. Uh, on the right side, um, top is a brass plaque, which we have made is now attached to the lattice work on that side of the porch. But the society has decided to dedicate this porch in the memory of, of Tom Bauer. And I, I hopefully that he, he will be very pleased to what he would see there today. Uh, as we go along, this is the, uh, so skip it. This is the second phase of construction on the lower level, which Tom was involved in. Uh, upper left is actually the, the archival uh, shelving that was purchased and put into the vault. Uh, it's obviously populated now with part of the collection. And the other photographs are of the rooms that were done downstairs. Uh, and right now, we're in, 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 in a, as uh, Fred said, we're in a state of flux. We've got uh, furniture stored here that goes up, it goes up into the museum proper. Uh, we have furniture stored here that's part of the collection, and we and hopefully when we get that sorted out, we'll bring back some of the, the, the uh, items, mostly furniture that's stored over in the courthouse. This is a view from the front. Uh, this was one of the last phases that we did uh, prior to the interior, uh, and this is what you will see when you approach. Uh, this, again, a strange house. Um, underneath the porch is the restroom from downstairs. Uh, as well as some closets. Uh, so if the, if the floor of the porch leaks, it leaks inside the base or inside the, the lower level. Uh, that's all been re redone. The, the, the flooring was uh, fractured and, and rotted. That was pulled up and replaced with water shield underneath of it. The ceiling was the same way. That was replaced. Uh, the, 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 these are the shutters. I don't know whether they would be the original shutters to the house, but they were hanging there when we started this renovation. The lower right picture is uh, a little, uh, as it would currently be today, it's been photoshopped a little bit by a professional photographer who, who did, did some work for us. Uh, the rear of the building, or what we're calling the rear because it has two fronts, this is the south facing facade. Uh, the upper left hand picture is a sleeping porch uh, that was added when the current roof was put on, we think in 1910. Uh, this is, uh, and the center picture is part of the exposed salt box roof. Uh, for those who aren't aware, a salt box roof is asymmetrical roof. Uh, the, the, the high point of, of, the, of the roof, unlike a gable roof where it's in the center, is skewed to one side. So you have a short, somewhat vertical wall or, or, or gable roof line, and then a long sloping one to the rear. A long sloping roof is, is stuck inside the building. Uh, this steep roof here is and was um, covered by the sleeping porch for the last hundred and some years. Uh, we, we have gone to HPC and gotten approval to have that uh, sleeping porch exterior removed. Uh, and because you, in the center picture shows the existing windows, there's three windows in there that will have been there hidden away for the last hundred some years will now be exposed and visible from the, from the street. Uh, the cedar shakes have been, have been removed uh, because there's nothing underneath them to keep them watertight. They'll be replaced with an in-kind uh, same pattern, same size, shingles and, and painted. Oops. Uh, this is the area between the Children's Museum on the left and the, the, the main museum on the right. The left-hand picture it was as it was. Uh, it had a uh, obviously a concrete sidewalk that was badly broken up with frost heave in bad shape. We've had that removed. Uh, and as it is today, it's simply mulched. Uh, the upper right hand picture is uh, the steps that come down from Park Street. So they, they actually come off the front sidewalk that leads to the museum. They, we were going to retain them. And the lower plan view is for a patio that we plan to put in. Uh, so the, the, the steps coming down, the curved steps will come down to, to a path of bluestone, will take us down to a, as large a, a bluestone patio as we can put in there. Um, and then a wrought iron railing protecting the, 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 the slope and the steps going down to Court Street. Uh, we've been very fortunate. Uh, we have uh, been put in touch with a, a company called Planted Earth out of Westminster um, via uh, Margaret Clark from Clark's Hardware. Uh, she sent uh, Justin down to us and we've done some work with them. They are going to pick up the labor to do this. Uh, the total total value or quote that they had 
was some $21,000. Uh, they're going to pick up $17,000 with the labor to build this. Uh, assuming we get approval, uh, Thursday, Thursday uh, we have a hearing before the Historic Preservation Commission uh, and hopefully get approval for that patio. Uh, I think that's going to be a tremendous asset to tie both sides of this campus together um, for events. Uh, if we if we light it, uh, probably with temporary lighting because of HPC, um, I think it's it's going to be a, a, a big asset to uh, what we have there. And my last slide, this is a picture of the completed workroom. Uh, this building is actually four floors. Um, it originally had a crawl space under the original, original stone structure. Somewhere along the line that was excavated out to head height and a door was added. Uh, so you have a basement. We have the, what I would call the lower level, which is storage, which I showed you a minute ago. Uh, then the museum level. And then this level is uh, the attic. It was pretty much finished, um, a little rough shape. So we had to do some repair work to the beadboard and it's painted. It will be a, both a workspace and additional storage space. Uh, for whatever it goes, goes on in, in the museum. The left picture is, is, is what we found, and I guess it's a, uh, an archive item. Uh, this dates the, the addition of the gable roof. Uh, as we said, the uh, salt box roof was stuck in between and actually hidden. We didn't really realize it was there until we did some demolition. Uh, but this is a tobacco pouch with a tax, state, uh, tax stamp dated 1910. And we found that sitting on top of the metal roof, okay, and underneath the attic floor. So the assumption would be that a worker tossed it there when they were doing the construction of the, the, the gable roof, which you see today. Uh, we also found uh, in there a stamp on the, the floor joist of that at construction. It says John S. Wilson, Lumberyard, Catesville, Maryland, which was back in uh, 1910. And I assume that's where the lumber was purchased from. So I think it's very exciting. I think it also be, I mean, needs to be noted that this has all been done with grant money. 100% uh, has come from either the county uh, with tremendous support from Calvin Ball. Uh, we have uh, the last, last grant uh, to kick us over the top this year was from Courtney Watson, a, a state delegate and, and, and the staff that supported that, uh, gave us enough to, to, to finish this project. The, uh, the I don't want to call it decorations. The displays that will be put in there are going to be funded by uh, the, the bequest from uh, Ed Walters and Lee Owens Warfield, uh, which it was very generous for them to leave us some funds. Part of that will be used, <clears throat> used to, to basically put the, the displays together. And I think that's what Pat's going to talk about, both, both the displays and <clears throat> the programs that she and Ann have put together. So hopefully this has been helpful. I think it's been a tremendous uh, uh, project and a tremendous asset to, to the uh, community. Thank you. Well, uh, George, thank you for sharing that. There's been a tremendous amount of work done uh, on that building. And uh, you've been there through you know, this whole project. And I can't thank you enough for, um, you know, I, I've seen you there you know, helping out and talking to the different, you know, contractors, looking over things, keeping us in the loop with emails. But so I remember one day I saw you down there raking some leaves. I mean, you have been, you know, so helpful. And I just want to be, you know, make sure that I, as one, thank you for the efforts that you put into uh, this building. And I know a lot of it, you, you could tell that this is something that you're passionate about because you'll show me a piece of wood and talk about it for five minutes and I'll be like, oh, I, it's, well, yeah, I, I got to go. It, right. But it's, <laughs> it is, it is, I've, I've gotten a lesson in um, construction that I never have had before. Well, uh, I, and, and it's awesome. It's fantastic. Well, so again, well, thank, I want you. To thank you for your efforts. I think it'd be remiss if I didn't thank Ellen for taking my phone calls. Um, she has stopped me from banging my head on the wall multiple times, uh, but it's been a pleasure. It's, it's been it's, it's really proud to do it. So thank you. Thank you. All right. So just quick, I want to talk about uh, just for a minute, and then I'm going to uh, hand it over to another one of our members. Um, I do want to um, sort of sort of shift a little bit. A lot of what we've talked about up to this point are the things that happened over 2021, sort of coming back to whatever normal is. 
uh, in terms of uh, our events and activities and things that we do through this organization. And although a number of the things that George spoke about did happen in, in January and even this month in February in the building that he uh, that, that is next to the um, Museum of Howard County History, um, I want to sort of focus now on what this year is that lies ahead. Um, you know, again, I am new to this position. I just took over uh, the 1st of January. And that transition has been um, at times challenging, but again, it's been very, very rewarding and finding out uh, sort of what, um, you know, what we, what we do here and what we're all about. Now, one of the things uh, that I want to focus on now is sort of what's going to be happening, hopefully over the next uh, uh, 10 to 12 months, you know, where we're going in 2022. Um, one of the biggest things that is going to occur in 2022 is we're going to take this um, this this building where all of this construction has taken place, and we're not just going to let it sit there and just be a static structure that doesn't have any purpose. We're going to be moving it into um, an active space, and the way that uh, we're going to sort of talk about that is I want to bring on Patricia uh, Greenwald, who's been really key in moving um, sort of the dial from this being a construction, you know, hard hat construction site to a space where we're going to have uh, people come in and have some wonderful experiences um, in this new Ellicott Mills Children's Museum. So Patricia, again, my technical things, I'm going to make you the co-host. So give me just a couple of seconds here. And I'm going to hand it over to you to talk about what the space is going to become in 2022. So Patricia, go ahead and take it away. Okay. You should be co-host now. There we go. Excellent. And let me get this onto the slideshow. Okay. okay, can everybody see that? I am sharing, good. Okay, I want to welcome you as the first visitors to the new Ellicott Mills Children's Museum, affectionately known as EMCM. Um, the name Weir Building seems to be sticking, but um, the Weirs only owned it for a short time. And then when they left it to the county, it became known as the Weird Building. So we would like to get it back to be, being the Children's Museum. Um, here I say it's opening April 23rd. That's the first official day that it's open to the public, but we will be having our dedication on the evening of April 22nd, all things considered. So let's see what's going on inside. Unfortunately, you know, we can't really get inside because the construction is still going on. So you're going to have to use your imagination here a little bit. Um, let me just back up a little bit. We're talking about going forward, but I'm gonna move back for a brief moment. About 10 years ago, Ann Schoenhut called me and asked if she could take me out to lunch. And I thought, oh, how nice. Well. She had an ulterior motive and she's very, her enthusiasm was contagious. I had so many things going on. I did not need another responsibility. But by the time I left lunch, I agreed, yeah, I'll go on the board of the Historical Society. Yes, I'll be on the Education Committee because Anne had this dream of turning this very derelict but very important old building into a museum for children. We spent the first year going around to all the surrounding counties, visiting their children's museums and getting ideas for what this might become. And let's step inside and see what it is becoming. If you enter, you'll be going through a time machine. We're focusing on the years from 1790 to 1830. The school was actually used, we know, as a Quaker school from 1820 to 1824. The Quaker school had been on the other side of the river, um, other side of Main Street, had boys and girls, boys on one floor, girls on the other. It became too crowded, so they moved the boys over to this building. Um, there is a lot of evidence that it had been used as a school even prior to that, but um, the boys came back in 18, 1820 and stayed until Rock Hill College was built in 1824. So as you enter and you're entering the early 19th century, you'll come through a garden. You'll probably first go into the education room, the school room, which will be a Quaker school room. Then you'll enter a commerce area, which will be the Ellicott store. 
we're currently looking for the name of a family on old census records, a mill family, that we can actually have this be their great room where their family conducted all of its activities. And then there'll be an exhibit about the mills and a fully functional bathroom, which this building never had before. And so let's take a look at some of these areas. Okay, whoops, it went one too far. Okay, we'll start in the Quaker schoolroom. Because I can't show you what it will really look like, I just have this simple schematic, which shows that we will have desk bench combinations, which are horribly uncomfortable. They had very straight backs. I guess they had to keep the boys awake and attentive. The teacher will be on the typical teaching stage. Um, we'll have a little work table in the back. And we do have several neat display items, a list of the Quaker testimonies, which was always at the front of a schoolroom. Also, um, a map of the period, which I actually found in Scotland, a map of Maryland from that era, and some very early, early math lithos. We also have a wonderful collection of old textbooks. One rule in this museum, by the way, lots of museums have signs that say, do not touch. The rule in this museum is everything is to be touched. We will have a basket of white gloves for people touching the old school books. Okay, we'll move into the Ellicott store. The Ellicott store sold everything. They had those hand forged nails. They have all those oysters, which JD Slack has been dutifully eating for us. So we will have oyster shells to put on our barrel. They sold fabrics, they sold china. They sold just about everything, never had anything prepackaged. Everything had to be weighed by the storekeeper. The storekeeper also served as the postmaster. He would weigh the letters, um, decide how much he would charge for them. There was no consistency. There were no postage stamps. He would just write a little thing in the upper right-hand corner of the envelope that the mailing had been paid for and the customer would be on their way. Um, also at that post office table, there is a legend that Benjamin Banneker as a young boy, eight, nine years old, could already read and write. And he would come down there and read letters coming in for illiterate mill workers and then write their letters in response. Um, so we're going to have some activities where kids will actually sit at the table and have an adult dictate a letter to them. And then general stores always had a game table, um, usually checkers. We're going to have a checkerboard there. We're also going to have some dominoes. It was a place for the community to get together and meet. We'll move on through the doorway into the family great room. Okay, great rooms in our modern houses are these huge rooms. The great room in an old house was very, very tiny, particularly in a mill worker's house. It's centered around the hearth. It was the only room in the house that was actually heated. That's why there's a bed in the room. If a family member were ill or a new baby had just been born, um, there was a spot for the recovering person to to stay in the room that had the heat. Um, but like I said, all activities took place there. Food was prepared, food was eaten, um, things were cleaned up, tools were sharpened, all the, the spinning and the uh, winding of the yarn and such took place there. It was basically where the family lived. So we're trying to represent all of those activities. Most of the furnishings are multifunctional. They had such a small room that they had to have a settle, which is a bench, but you're ready for the meal. So you flip the back of the bench over, it becomes a table. The cradle can become a bench when there's no baby in the house. So we really looked for those multifunctional furnishings. And from there, you'll step into a display about the mills. We couldn't actually have a mill, but we have a display about the mills so that we can read about them and honor the fact that they were the purpose for Ellicott Mills. And they're basically a grist mill, which brings us to the garden. Bob Glasscock, who's a master gardener, is taking over the work on the garden. Um, one of his dreams is to have a little wheat field and kids can actually pick the wheat and then bring it inside and grind it. Um, with the help from the Patapsco Heritage Greenway, we've gotten a grant that will help us realize 
a garden and also Clark's Hardware and Planted Earth Landscaping have been very good about donating their time and services. Um, the hope is for the garden to reflect about the year 1804 because Bob Glasscock found an 1804 Bartram's seed catalog. So we know what they were growing, which was basically local native plants. So that's what we're aiming for. But to get ready for our uh, dedication ceremony, we had the Boy Scouts from Troop 75 come and dig out a couple of feet along the sidewalk on either side. And then a few weeks later, Bob led us in planting over 300 bulbs. Now he researched them carefully and these are all guaranteed to be blooming on the 22nd of April. So fingers crossed, that is exactly what's going to happen. Okay, we had to start acquiring all the furnishings. So the first thing we did was put it out to all of you, probably you remember receiving a lengthy email that had these attachments. Um, what we were looking for for each room that would reflect that 1790 to, 17, to 1830 time frame. Um, we put a little illustration so people would know exactly what we were looking for. And then as the items came in, we indicated in red on our sheets what we had received. And it was incredible. This just happens to be one from the great room. And then also for each room, we had a second sheet of just the little things that we needed. And here you can see that almost everything came in. Something like Crocs, I didn't put names on because we received so many, the pottery we received so many. So virtually everything on this sheet was donated and that's the case with the other rooms as well. So thank you everybody. And then there were some things that weren't donated. So we had to hit the antique shops. Um, the antique dealers were wonderful when they heard what we were doing. They were wonderful about reducing their prices and giving us fantastic discounts. So we, we've acquired just, the only thing we still need is a blackboard and our Franklin stove for the um, general store is out on loan for the next four years. So we really could use a Franklin stove. And if anybody has a real piece of slate, we could use a blackboard. Okay, yesterday as I was putting this together, it occurred to me that several people were working on things even at that moment for the Children's Museum. This is Dr. Mark Fratkin, who in his basement workshop, which is an incredible place, tells me that what he is doing here, and I have to quote this, is fitting the top of the shelf center support mortise to a tenon joint. This will evolve into the counter for the general store. Um, Mark and his friend Jack Spencer, at no expense to us except for the lumber and the hardware, made four bench desk combinations for the uh, schoolroom and also two additional benches. And then Mark made a bookcase for the schoolroom. Those are already in our possession, and he is hard at work on the counter. Over at my house, my husband yesterday was working at rehabilitating, reconditioning the top of an old desk, which happens to have 26 little cubbies, perfect for the alphabet in the post office area. And then across town still further, we had two of our favorite Girl Scouts, Reagan and Jocelyn, who were working with their moms, getting things ready for the general store. You can see they've made a thread rack, um, they're rolling fabric onto cardboard pieces to have car, um, fabric for sale in the, in the fabric part department of the general store. And in the lower picture, the girls are making hardtack. They've taken home several of the apothecary jars that were donated and they're filling them with coffee beans, tea, sugar. And I had hardtack on the list. They made the hardtack. I'm a Swede. I grew up on hardtack. I didn't even know you could make it. I thought you bought it. Okay, and Betsy Grader yesterday, all these pictures were sent to me yesterday, by the way, as the people were doing the work. Betsy Grader is using fabric that is a reproduction of an 1820 fabric to make the curtains for the great room. And she informed me yesterday evening that they are done and ready for pickup. And while we're talking about fabric, 
Another incredible person, Catherine Blacka, made us two quilts all out of period fabrics, reproduction fabrics from that 1790 to 1830 era. She made two quilts for the bed in the great room, one to hang over the end and one to be actually on the bed. She made a little quilt for the cradle. And then she said she had to do something with the scraps. So she made another cradle quilt, which we will use as a window covering in the, um, in the restroom, which overlooks the front porch. Okay, so we get all these things together. What are we gonna use them for? Well, every Sunday, Saturday and Sunday afternoon from one to five, we will be open for drop-ins. Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa can bring the kids by. Um, no appointments or anything necessary. It's purely on a drop-in basis. Oops. And groups such as scout groups or church groups or homeschool groups, small private schools can also make appointments to come on Saturday mornings or really any time on Friday for an experience for their group. And we'll meet with the leaders beforehand and see what they want. If the scouts are working for a particular badge or patch, I'm sure we can fulfill that need. You won't be required to do any laundry when you come. Okay. Over the last few years, in order to know what we were going to do with all of these people when they came to, actually, did I skip a slide here? Yes, I did. There, sorry about that. Um, for the last several years, we've been having regular activities, bringing kids to the museum. Um, we did it the first Saturday of every month in I believe it was 2018. Um, we would market test a certain theme. And we would usually have like a PowerPoint to introduce them and elicit some discussion. And then they would break into groups and visit three different tables for experiences related to the theme. Um, so we market tested a lot of things and I have a few pictures of that. Um, our Ed, EDCOM, the education committee team led this and the little girls in the top corner, one of those you just saw working on the um, general store items at home yesterday. Um, here they, we had a spring planting activity and they made little lambs. The other picture has kids making Valentine's for the birds. Valentine's Day originally was for the birds. So it's very appropriate to show some love to our feathered friends on Valentine's Day. Um, sometimes we had activities at the museum here or at the, um, at Miller here and Schoenhut is working with a group of kids on a Native American, um, Howard County Native American project. Sometimes things were wonderful, but we just decided we can't continue to do them. This is a tea party. Um, we had two tea parties and we decided they were so work intense and we don't know if we'll have space in the new museum to do them. So some things we tried and we may not follow through with. And just for fun, I put together a chart with the three main rooms, the school room, great room, and general store, took some of the themes we had done and found an activity that we did for that theme that would fit into every store. Every month we'll have a special activity that is just for that month. And we'll actually have two of them. One will be a hands-on make it craft a kind of activity. And the other one will be a paper and pencil kind of activity. Okay. this was only limited by the size of the paper. I mean, we could have gone on and on. Anne has come up with another list of things. So we have a lot more things. They're all in tubs at our houses. We're very anxious to get them over to the workroom and put them to use. Okay, to do that, we're, we were going to need volunteers, particularly volunteer docents and volunteers to get all the activities ready to go. And so back on October 9th, we had a volunteer fair and we were very pleased that over 50 people came and signed up to volunteer. And here are those two girls again. Um, they were the hit of the volunteer fair. They showed what even middle schoolers could do. The girls crafted our checkerboard. They made the checkers using a radial arm saw. 
they made a set of wooden dominoes. They made the Jacob's Ladders, four Jacob's Ladders. If you've ever tried to make one, it's about impossible. Oh, they sewed bags to put all these things into. They made four cloth balls, four cloth dolls, all the blocks you see down in front, a bag of clay marbles. And they are, they've worked on a lot of things for the general store. They put together a sewing basket. Um, I now have them trying to do some cross-stitch samplers. We'll see if they master that one. Okay, we've been calling together small groups of the people who signed up to volunteer to go over um, their responsibilities and possibilities with them, kind of by the theme of what they wanted to volunteer for. Here we're meeting with some of the reenactors and the people who volunteered to do uh, research. And we've been doing this on Thursday mornings and we have a few more coming up on Saturday mornings. And Fran Schellenberger has been working with Linda Kissack and Phyllis to put together a docent manual for the docents, which will include all the things like where is the fire alarm, what do you do for an emergency, you know, how do you get in, all the nitty gritty. But it will also have the activities that are available all the time in each of the rooms. We're trying to have at least five or six hands-on activities that anybody who walks in on one of those Saturday or Sunday afternoons can do and it will be there and ready for them. And then, like I said, there'll be a special activity of the month also. And we also, for each room, have a list of things for the docents to point out to visitors. Things like, why don't we have a cash register? Well, they weren't invented until during the Civil War. Instead, we have a spike, which is like a long, heavy nail that comes up and receipts, receipts and money owed were put onto the spikes. So there are lots of little interesting tidbits that uh, we would like the docents to be aware of. And we hope that you are looking forward to bringing the kids to enjoy your new museum. And we also want to point out that you don't have to have kids to come. You can bring yourself and enjoy it without children. So we are very excited that this is about to come to fruition and we can start our activities soon. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. If you can uh, stop sharing the screen and then I'll take back the hosting there. Reclaim host, all right. Um, I have met with uh, Patricia and Anne a number of times and I cannot express to you how much um, energy and time and effort that these two have put into this space. And it's going to be a fantastic new addition to Ellicott City, a fantastic new addition to our historical society. So, um, and we're, we're in the, the, the final push, you know, we have, um, you know, really uh, just March and April, and then this this place will be an oper in operation, and it will be, a again, a fantastic space. So just keep paying attention, updates, emails, and things of that nature. I'm um, going to go back real quick to my PowerPoint. I got a few other uh, things to look forward to in 2022. I mean, the Children's Museum is a keystone um, uh, uh, space, and the series of <clears throat> events that are going to occur there are going to be fantastic. But I also want to point out a couple of other things to look forward to, things that you yourself might be interested in or possibly, uh, you know, spread the word and let others know so that we can pull more individuals in. So the first thing I want you to be aware of is that we are uh, connected to a number of other organizations. We have partner organizations that we work with. And over the course of 2022, if you do not hear the term EC250, you are not going outside at all. You are not participating in the life of the community that is Howard County. Um, it is the 250th um, uh, year uh, of Ellicott City, the founding of Ellicott City. And EC250 is going to be uh, doing hundreds, not even just dozens, hundreds of various activities, large and small. And the Howard County Historical Society is connected to a lot of these events. So we're gonna be partnering with them. And we already have, just uh, to point out one uh, uh, thing that we've done so far, and there's a, there's a couple of others, but you know, time-wise, I don't wanna go over every single little thing. Um, we were part of the recording of the, uh, the a, a new YouTube video that came out that was filmed um, 
in our museum, outside the museum, by the Children's Museum and in other places along the Patapsco Valley that focuses on the Ellicott Legacy exhibit, which I'll talk about in just a second, and also pioneering along the Patapsco. Uh, that was premiered last week. Um, it's got fantastic reception. Um, and there are a number of interesting historical characters that can talk about some of the things that are in our historical, uh, our museum of, of history, uh, but also about uh, some, some broader things that are happening along the Patapsico and in Ellicott City itself. Um, if you go to the website, www.ec250.com, they have a calendar of events. Uh, and that calendar just keeps getting added to more and more things going on. And you can then see the things that the historical society is partnering uh, with them on. So pay attention to that term, EC250. You absolutely are going to hear about that. Now, in terms of this video, this YouTube video, one part of it was connected to a brand new exhibit that we have at the uh, uh, Museum of Howard County History. And that is the Ellicott Legacy Exhibit. Um, it is up and running, and you are more than welcome to come by and check it out. It basically showcases and features uh, the sort of founding Ellicott family. So it even goes before that, the founding of Ellicott City. It goes back to uh, across the Atlantic Ocean and where that family resided um, over in England. Talks a little bit about the Irish and Scottish connections and about them coming to America, the founding of Ellicott City, and then talks about a number of prominent Ellicotts uh, throughout history. Uh, so the, a huge section, if you know the museum, uh, the space to the right of our, our, our wonderful organ has been uh, uh, sort of made into this wonderful new exhibit. Uh, former uh, executive director Sean Gladden uh, put a tremendous amount of effort into making this space come alive. There are dozens of objects that go back in history, that transport you back in history, and we're going to be using that space for this exhibit, uh, certainly throughout the year, probably even beyond that. I'll also say that a number of those, uh, a number of the objects that are in the exhibit are going to be showcased in the uh, Howard County Arts Council, where they are going to be utilizing artists to paint, draw, sculpt, photograph, and do a number of things with these uh, objects that are going to be showcased in an exhibit later on this year. So uh, pay attention to that space. If you've not come down and seen it yet, please come down uh, during our operating hours, which again, Friday through Sunday, one to five. All right. A um, couple of other things. For those individuals who went on our uh, road trip back in 2021, we are going to be uh, running three road trips um, this year. Uh, the first one, which has already been advertised, and you're more than welcome to call in to make reservations during our opening hours. If you call the Historical Society, we can take your information down. You can mail us a check also. Um, we're going to be going out west to Monocacy Battlefield, um, which is just outside of Frederick, Maryland. Now, Monocacy was a, a battle that occurred in 1864 towards the end of the Civil War. But once that battle ended, a number of Union troops came down the National Road, the Frederick Turnpike, and ended up in um, Ellicott City. So we're going to be driving out there. Um, I'll be running to a, a tour of that battlefield, giving you a background about the things that took place there um, in 1864. We'll be stopping in Frederick for lunch, uh, and I'll be giving you a little bit of time to walk in, in those sort of the downtown historic district of Frederick, uh, doing a little bit of shopping too. So it should be a wonderful day out again, um, April 9th. Discount for members, uh, lunch is included in the price, so by all means, uh, sign up as quickly as possible. The second trip we're going to be taking, Ed Lilly, you might have heard of him. He and I are going to be going out to Greenmount Cemetery um, later on in the summer, and we're going to be doing a tour of that cemetery focusing on um, people from Howard County. And because it's EC250, it's probably going to have a focus on Ellicott City individuals who are buried there. So we will drive out to Greenmount Cemetery. We'll have lunch in Baltimore. We'll get a little walking tour of the cemetery. And we'll talk about other individuals because there's a number of famous individuals buried there. And it's an amazing cemetery if you've not been there before. And then one of the things that I've been uh, trying to keep in uh, sort of the, 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 the center of my sights as I am developing my position here as the um, executive director is I really want to focus uh, and expand the concept of local history. Uh, we do a lot of things that are Howard County focused, 
but sometimes we want to go beyond our borders of a county and connect with other counties. So we're going to be uh, partnering uh, with the uh, Carroll County Historical Society, heading out there to tour their facilities, see what they have on offer, talk about the history that connects our two counties, and it'll be a wonderful day out. That's further down in the fall. I don't have specific dates for either the summer or fall trip. Those are still in, in uh, uh, the creation phase. Uh, but just kind of keep those on your radar because you'll be seeing us advertise those soon. So again, please sign up for the uh, Monocacy Battlefield Tour and I hope you look forward to the other two. Um, one of the big things that's going to be happening in terms of the museum this year is that our wonderful organ, which by the way, works, but if you're, so if you're not a musician, it sounds okay. If you are a musician, there's a lot of squeaky parts to it. Uh, there are a couple of dead keys. There are a couple of areas where the bellows aren't working quite right. Um, so we have uh, been allocated funds uh, from generous donations from our members to uh, refurbish. Um, and what I found out very interestingly enough is there's a difference between restoring and refurbishing. Uh, restoring means we take it completely out, fix every single thing, do everything to it and put it back in. Uh, that's an undertaking that is far beyond what we want to do uh, because it works and we've had it inspected and the person inspected said this is a, a pretty nice organ considering that it's about 120 years old. Um, but we're going to be getting some things refurbished and then what that's going to allow us to do is in the fall, this should happen towards the end of the summer, we should get this refurbishment done. In the fall, we're going to have a couple of concerts uh, with that organ. We've already talked to a couple of individuals who are interested in playing there, and it will be a fantastic time. On top of that, I want you to keep on your radar and share with other individuals that our concerts at the, uh, um, the museum are going to expand. On March 19th, we have an Irish tenor coming to visit who's going to be singing uh, sort of traditional Irish music and modern uh, classics. Uh, to to our, our customers or, or to our, our members. Uh, unfortunately, that, that concert has sold out. So you need to jump on those things when we do advertise them. But we're going to be having other concerts too. There's going to be a concert called This Old Town uh, later on uh, at the towards the end of spring. We're going to be trying to host uh, additional events there. Uh, to utilize that space. Because if anybody's ever been there during a concert, acoustically, it is a wonderful space and it sounds really, really nice uh, in the museum. So please pay attention to that. In terms of a couple of other things to whet your appetite, things to keep your eye out for later on in the year. The Howard County Historical Society and the Howard County Genealogy Society are gonna co-host a genealogy day. At, and, and for all these things I'm about to talk about, I don't have specific dates yet. This is all in the works. Uh, we're going to be hosting a genealogy day um, at the Howard County uh, Miller Branch Library, uh, where we're going to sort of hopefully get people in and find a little bit more about their family's history. We're going to host a antique appraisal day. So we're going to have sort of our own antiques roadshow going on at the uh, Miller Branch Library. We're doing that with the library system also. Boy, it's, you know, it's when you create a PowerPoint, it's, it's during the presentation, you notice your, your uh, spelling errors and your, your grammar errors, I just noticed too. So please forgive the errors in this particular slide. Um, we're also gonna be continuing our lunch lecture series. I have a uh, website there, which is our, our homepage for our uh, History Society's website. We have, a, you know, we have our Friday lunch lectures, which always has good attendance. I would like to see that increase. I would like to see more people showing up for these wonderful lectures. Little uh, 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 sales pitch here, March 4th, we have um, Kevin Leonard of the, um, the Laurel History Boys is going to be coming and talking about a couple of concerts that took place in Laurel back at the uh, late 1960s, early 1970s, the uh, um, Laurel Pops Festival and the Laurel Jazz Festivals. We'll talk about who was there, the, pre the performances and some interesting history surrounding those. Um, and we're also going to be partnering with the Howard County Library to have a couple of lunch lectures. Uh, the first one will probably start uh, May, June um, in person in the, the, the Miller Branch Library. Those lectures are probably going to be broader in scope in terms of history, not just focusing on Howard County history, but broader history. And you should uh, uh, pay attention to those announcements. A couple of new exhibits are going to be coming out um, uh, in the museum. One of one's going to have to do with the um, the Howard County at War 
um, uh, uh, exhibit, which should be just uh, coming in, in November, where we're going to be redoing a couple of cabinets in the in the museum, where uh, we're going to let you know about um, um, Howard County uh, servicemen and women and their participation in a number of conflicts during the 20th century. Uh, we're also going to have smaller exhibits coming out featuring different interesting things. One of the, the things I really want to do with the museum is make it uh, more dynamic and not as static. I want to make sure that every couple of months there's a new exhibit uh, featuring new items and new things to draw people in. So we've already had some things uh, in the works on that. We have the new Ellicott Legacy. We have the new um, the EC200 Shadow Box, which went up, and we're going to have a couple of new displays within the next couple of weeks. So you want to wander down. Sometimes they're just small things with three or four items. Sometimes they will be larger uh, displays. Um, also, we are starting to put up some exhibits in the reading room here at the archives. Um, these are going to be major exhibits, but things that will draw more people in. Uh, there's a wonderful shadow box that's been created that uh, features a number of campaign pins and accoutrement to various local elections that have occurred here in Howard County. Um, we're going to have a display case in about two weeks that is going to focus on letters that we're going to that we've taken out of the archives are going to put on display. We have a really interesting letter about an early elephant complaining about a cow that keeps wandering onto their property. Uh, we have a letter from a uh, American serviceman who wrote a Christmas card in 1944 to his family back here in Howard County. We have uh, letters that have to do with uh, President Kennedy, unfortunately turning down attendance at a um, an event that he was invited to. Now it's not, Kennedy didn't sign it himself, but it's from his office. So it, the theme is letters and it's gonna have about a dozen letters in there. And those are gonna be the original archival pieces that people can come and view. And then that display case is gonna see every couple of months a new uh, exhibit coming out. We really wanna take those thousands of items in the archive, which are wonderful, and they're there, but people don't get access to them and don't see them enough. So we want to start to bring them out and make them more dynamic. We are uh, uh, on. Um, uh, we are working on a new uh, two new Civil War trail markers, which will appear in Ellicott City later on this year. Uh, one dealing with United States colored troops. Another uh, dealing with something called the Winus gun, which is a really sort of interesting, strange. Uh, invention and something occurred in Ellicott City with this uh, th this gun that used center centrifuge force to throw bullets rather than using gunpowder to make that uh, to propel bullets. Um, a really interesting invention and a really interesting moment in Ellicott City history. Uh, we work we're working with the Civil War Trails uh, uh, organization to get those installed. They'll be coming out hopefully sometime in the summer. We've increased our social media presence, just a couple of things. If you've never been to our YouTube channel, we do record most of our events, uh, uh, especially the ones that are on Zoom, and we make sure that we put those there. Um, our YouTube channel has dozens and dozens of wonderful uh, videos that you can watch. Facebook is a great way to see updates on the things that we are posting. We just broke uh, 5,000 um, uh, um, friends, as you know, Facebook uses friends, but 5,000 members to our Facebook page. We just went over that in January, so that's fantastic. We are showcasing just photographs on Instagram, and we have launched ourselves into the, 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 the 20th cent, 21st century by getting on TikTok. I have been posting videos, short little historical videos um, uh, on that website. We just, uh, we have over 10,000 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, members to that TikTok page, um, 835,000 views, just to kind of give you an idea of the power of social media. More, more views within the last year on TikTok than we've had the entire time we've been on Facebook and Instagram combined uh, by a massive factor. So we're utilizing social media to get out there. Just recently, about Four or five oh, days ago, I posted a short video on uh, Decatur Dorsey. I went down to the Civil War trail marker down on Frederick Road, recorded about a 40 second video just about his history and that Civil War trail marker. And as of 35 seconds ago, it has 1,818 views.
So utilizing social media in a way that gets our local history out to a worldwide audience is something I'm very much focused on. Uh, the courthouse, I'm working with a number of judges and lawyers to come up with a courthouse event later on in the year, probably in September, where we're going to have a small exhibit at the museum and an event uh, uh, talking about the courthouse. Uh, and there's going to be much, much more. So I just want you to know that we are back. We are moving forward with so many things. We're keeping what's worked and we're adding lots of things uh, to this organization. So um, I want to thank everybody for attending today. I want to thank you and hope that you got some uh, sort of uh, idea of what I'm trying to do as executive director and what all of these wonderful board members and volunteers are doing to make this place, uh, the Howard County Historical Society, a wonderful organization. Um, Ellen, I don't know if you wanted to say anything else in closing. Um, give no, you a second I'll just to say, there. I'll just Sorry. echo your thanks to everybody for making us who we are and helping spread the word and let people know that indeed we are back uh, stronger than ever and uh, partnering and reaching out and collaborating in ways that we've never been able to do before. One of the advantages of the crazy pandemic is that we've learned to pivot uh, and find ways to make what we do more accessible uh, to wider audiences, to be transportable, uh, for someone to look at something later, not if they can't necessarily make the, the first thing. So um, remember that everything you do helps support this. And um, we thank you and everyone who works so hard to make this and this organization what it is. Thank you, Ellen. All right, I wanna thank everybody for attending. I'm not gonna follow Robert's rules of order. I'm just gonna go ahead and say that we're gonna end this. I don't think we need a second on that. No, nope, um, we're ending by consensus. <laughs> by consensus, excellent. <laughs> well, I will uh, let you all go. I hope to see you all in person. Remember, you're welcome to swing down by the museum or the archive at any time. Be happy to show you around, all right? Everybody have a good day and uh, see you in the future. Bye-bye everybody. Bye everyone.